And with that, it's time for a keynote. We've already had two this week um, on our theme of a little bit of history repeating. Um, we had Matt Todd, to start with, talking about how he's looking at our history as a community and applying lessons from what we've done in a completely different field that has the power to save lives, which is awesome. Um, yesterday, we had Karen doing a review of her personal history with her pacemaker and her personal journey, which started it in some ways at an LCA. Today, for something different, we've got, what's your name? Hugh, <laughs> Hugh Lemmings. Um, Hugh, Hugh's been uh, around the Linux Australia community since before there was a Linux Australia. Um, he was part of the Canberra Linux users group. He knew some people a bit there. And he was at Kalu in 1999, where he got to know them a lot better and thought that this was something cool that he wanted to be more involved in. And since then, he's gone on to work in open source. He's been vice president of Linux Australia twice, once. He's been president once. Um, have you run a conference? OK, so he's not entirely crazy. <laughs> but he's here to tell you some about his personal journey and the Australian open source scene over the last 20 years as he's seen it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, James, for that uh, very gracious introduction. And amazingly, the technology has worked. Um, I'm humbled and actually quite honoured to be doing the keynote today. Uh, you only need to look at something like Matthew's talk at the, earlier in the week and uh, Karen's talk yesterday to realise kind of the, the size of the shoes you have to, to fill. And um, so quite, a, quite humbling to be asked to fill that same spot. The fact that I'm here at all... Um, Perhaps bears a little bit of an explanation in a way. I actually put a submission, I've spoken at LCAs before as a presenter, but um, hadn't really had much to talk about, I thought, for quite a while. So, but this, this, this time around, I thought, no, actually, I think I can, I can usefully contribute. So I put a paper submission in talking about some experiences last year with being unexpectedly out of work in the free software community and uh, some reflections on that. And to cut a long story short, I got a message sort of a little bit out of the blue from the organiser to say, could we talk to you about your talk? Just, just want to change the time. I was like, Sure, okay. We can talk about that by email, right? And so, oh, no, probably better if we, if we talk to you in person. I thought, no, no, I know James and Bruce quite well. I think maybe they're embarrassed to tell me by email that they actually don't want me to do the talk at all. <laughs> and, um, but no, we, so we eventually got on the phone and said, yeah, we thought we'll move it to one of the mornings at sort of probably nine o'clock or something like that. So, yeah, sure. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll think a little, bit, a little bit about that. So, um, so, so here I am, and I'll, I'll certainly try and do, uh, do my best to do the, do the talk justice. My life story is really of only of interest to my mum, if indeed anyone, so I'll try and keep this um, pretty brief. But the, 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 the kind of the touch points, I guess, is that I'm, I'm, I'm largely self-taught. I started off uh, sort of working in electronics and ham radio and that sort of thing as an eight-year-old pulling things apart. That's my um, first computer at age 15, a Commodore 4016. I remember to this day the joy when we upgraded it from 16 kilobytes to 32 kilobytes and memories. The whole talk's not going to be lots of this sort of get off my lawn, you young kids kind of, <laughs> kind of stuff, but there's some pieces that I think uh, there are pertinent. The one piece of formal training I had early on, which I'm very grateful for, was a, um, a, the introductory programming unit at the University of Canberra towards an electronics engineering degree, which I didn't, I didn't actually complete the, the rest of the degree, but it was good to have a bit of an insight into structured programming, because if you're self-taught, you often don't get that sort of discipline, but otherwise my academic history is very much that of Blemings could do better if he applied himself. Though I did get an A for the computer units at high school, so that was kind of a step in the right, right direction. Various twists and turns from there, so playing in rock bands rather than sort of going to work in tech, and I had a pivotal conversation with a customer of all things where he said, how does MIDI work? And I said, it's 31.25 kiloboard 8-bit asynchronous protocol, opto-isolated 5 milliamp current loop. And he's like, why are you working in a music shop? You know, sort of. <laughs> So that kind of kicked it off, and it was actually uh, going, going, to, going to work for a, um, a small Canberra uh, engineering firm doing electronics design and embedded design. And the embedded piece will be a little bit of a theme as we go through the talk for, for reasons which I hope will become apparent. But I, I did cut my teeth on 8-bit micros in C and, uh, and Assembler, and that gave me an appreciation for small systems. But a few twists and turns, um, bumping into a guy named Tim Potter, part of the Samba team, introduced me to Linux, and it kind of went from there. And, um, a few more twists and turns later, I'm now um, fortunate enough to have got what I consider to be my dream job working at the Open Power Foundation as the, the executive director. I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about that as we come along, but just perhaps a bit of a footnote that 
the majority of what I'm going to say today is just speaking for myself only rather than formally representing the, uh, the, the foundation. So the basic agenda, and we, we've had a bit of a theme of a little bit of history repeating itself and I've had the good fortune to be around for, for much of that history so I thought I'd, I'd share some of that. Um, I want to talk about the community uh, a little bit from my, my original talk as it was originally kind of accepted, a bit about the Open Power Foundation and probably a few digressions hopefully of relevance uh, along the way. So without too much ado, I thought we'd kick off and just take a, talk a few highlights from um, Calu and the early days of Linux Conf AU. Now of course you could literally make, now we've had of the order of 18 of these, you could do pretty much an entire hour on that, I shan't. But um, the first conference, the first event of course was Calu Conference of Australian Linux Users, 1999. The apocryphal story of Rusty funding it off his credit card is actually true. He did actually pretty much fund the whole thing himself and I'm pleased to say he did actually get his money back. Um, the 99 was pretty early days, we had no network, no, no Wi-Fi at that event. This was very much the height of the, uh, the powers of Slashdot, which someone was kind enough to print off and stick up on a notice board each morning so that uh, people would still get their, uh, get their fix. We didn't have an event in 2000, but, um, and Rusty has sworn off ever running another one, which I think is pretty much something he's stuck to this, to this day. But the uh, Sydney Linux user group and people associated with that thought, no, actually, that, that event was pretty good. We should, we should have another one of those. And so the first Linux Conf AU in this fair city was, uh, was run in 2001. Rusty did a presentation. In fact, he had, had put three into, or submitted three, and actually had them all accepted all in the same time slot. So he thought, well, <laughs> To his great credit, he was able to roll that together in some, some quite cohesive and useful fashion. This particular event, as the, the, uh, the photo suggests, was also the start of what's been a, a fine tradition uh, for, for LCA, and that is um, sort of auctioning and, and seeking to support uh, charities and, and, and uh, positive causes. In this particular case, it was a, a couple of t-shirts were auctioned and the, um, the, the proceeds of that went to the Free, the free Software Foundation. But it started a, a, what I think is a, a strong tradition of supporting local charities and of course we've, we've got our own this, this year uh, one, once again and that's been a strong part of the, the fabric of I think what's made up made LCA and I think indeed the, the broader free software commons in Australia is so special. I've been unable to find a photo of 2002, I was there, but it was significant um, for being the uh, first LCA that had a uh, mini-conf and a Debian mini-conf was, was run there. As I recall, the mini-conf pretty much did consist of a table with some badges and some pens on it, but a, but a, a good start. But it started what's become a, 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 a very much an entrenched and worthwhile part of, uh, of LCA, the, the, the mini-comps. 2003 was, was special. It was always all the way on the other side of the country. It was the first time Linus Torvalds attended the event. The, the story goes that Linus said, well, I'll come along as long as you put me in a penguin suit. So they did, and he did. But from us in the audience, we were so curious why there's this a, you know, a penguin walking around was somewhat unremarkable at a Linux conference, but it was a little bit surprising when, who, to see who it was that popped out. For 2004, Linus was wise enough to say, well, I'll only come back if, uh, if you can put me in a dunk tank, um, which, of course, they, they did. And again, this was a, was a charity component to this, where, the, where uh, there was an auction held for who would have the right to, to throw the sandbag to dunk, uh, to dunk Linus. 2005 returned to my long-term, uh, or was the first time in my long-term home, Canberra. Uh, Tridge did a talk about interoperating with version control systems that uh, <laughs> kind of kicked a few, a few things off from there. Um, but it was one of a number of really, really fascinating talks, sadly unrecorded uh, for, for reasons I, I no longer recall. 2006, and this is the last one, I'll also stop it at this point because it usefully gets us over the pond and into Point. 2006 was significant. It was the first time we'd held a Linux Conf AU uh, overseas in, the, in uh, beautiful Dunedin uh, in, in New Zealand. The gentleman in question is uh, Van Jacobson, who wrote, a, wrote or was instrumental in the TCP IP header uh, compression algorithm. So a fairly integral part of the, the underlying fabric of our, of our modern day networking. The story goes that he arrived uh, a little early and uh, to the conference and was just wandering around and sort of said to the organisers, "Can I you know, anything I can?" help with it. No one was really quite sure who he was, but it's a very unassuming, unassuming chat. They said, well, do you know how to crimp Cat5 cables? <laughs> sure. So off he, off he went, and that was, uh, that was his, his contribution. <laughs> but uh, 
I suppose I, I wanted to run through the, the, these few just to sort of give a bit of a sense of, uh, of where we've come from and, and particularly given that, that we're, we're back in Sydney now for the third time and we've got that theme of, of history repeating. But I think it's, um, it's fair to say that, that Linux Conf AU is a fairly integral part of the Australia New Zealand free software, sort of open source software. So Landscape by no means the only one that we've had OSDC, Drupal Conf, uh, WordPress, any, other, any number of other events over the years that have, have added to that vibrancy. But, um, it's a pretty important part of it. So I thought with that in mind, just talk a little bit more about, more about free and open source software in Australia and New Zealand uh, a bit more generally. Now I'm going to make a, a little bit of a, a sweeping statement there and have a quick drink of water while I, while I do. Oh, excuse me. Nothing worse than someone drinking with a live microphone. So um, I think between Australia and New Zealand, we have a unique for our population, one of the most vibrant and wonderful free and open source software communities in the world. Not, not without its flaws, we've had our, had our wobbles uh, to be sure, but given the size of our population, I think we have a positive impact out of yeah. proportion with that size. Yeah. <laughs> really um, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying this to be nationalistic, this is really just a, a geographical population size sort of uh, observation, but I, I think the, uh, the esprit de corps that we enjoy in Australia and New Zealand culturally has sort of moved nicely into the way we engage with, with free software and open hardware uh, in the region. And I thought we really do have this lovely technical comment, so I thought I'd try and just acknowledge at least some of the folk that have been involved with that and some of the projects that they've been involved with, and, and just to illustrate that rich heritage. Now, it's, the next slide is a little bit of an eye chart, and it's going to um, suffer the sort of the inevitable. Now, I've left people off, obviously, and not through any, anything other than they just haven't come to mind and, and there may be projects there. So, but what I sought to do here is I, I thought, well, who are the people, who are the people I really admire, I really think are, are, are significant? And I, I so put them on and then I reached out to a few and said, well, you know, who are, the, who are the people, who are the projects that have inspired you? And I've added that. So it's by no means an exhaustive list and any, any errors or omissions are, are certainly mine. But I'll just sort of take a few minutes to step through a couple of... Uh, a couple of what I think are the highlights, just to illustrate that breadth and depth that we have in our, in our community here. So the first one, to my embarrassment, was one I almost missed. It was actually a conversation with, a, with uh, Andy Gilm at the start of the week that uh, put this back into to mind. Is um, a computer, Australian computer scientist named John Lyons. John, back in 1976, wrote a book called The Lyons Commentary on Unix 6 edition, significantly with source code. And what was significant with that book at the time was it was the only freely available in the sense of being able to use it in a classroom or a similar sort of context, commentary and source code on the Unix operating system outside Bell Labs. So it became a really pivotal part of many computer science courses in those, in those early days. What was also significant about the sixth edition, it was, it was the last version of the book that what did have that permissive license and it was actually allowed to be used in that, in that form. The seventh edition, in fact, explicitly excluded this. I'll point out at this point I was about eight years in age, so I'm sort of, this is something I've also learned from history myself. But this, the, um, the book sort of got, got around in its sixth edition form largely through the process of what was then illegal photocopying and apparently became one of the most illegally copied or widely and illegally copied computer science texts of all time because of its, because of its significance. Another person I'd like to call out is Pierre Andrews or Pierre Nee War. Pierre um, would be well known to many of you in this, in this crowd. Um, she was instrumental in a number of things. The first time I, I met Pia was uh, when she was involved with Linux Australia back in 2003. And while Linux Australia had been operational prior to 2003, it was, it was kind of quiet, and I don't say that in a negative sense at all or with any disrespect to the people involved back then, but Pia kind of came along and brought that sort of boundless energy she seems to have into really rebooting Linux Australia and through that uh, energising the community and the conferences. Not content with uh, the work she's doing in Linux Australia, she went on to be instrumental in GovHack, uh, in open data, and I guess just generally normalising open source across a, a wide range of organisations, private and public uh, sectors in, in Australia and New Zealand, and in fact is now, now based in New Zealand doing that very, that very thing. Speaking of New Zealand, Vic Oliver is uh, not a name I think that's as, as widely known as perhaps ought to be. Uh, Vic's a, a computer scientist engineer from, from New Zealand. It was instrumental in the development uh, of, the, of a thing called a RepRap, which was a, intended to be a self-replicating 3D printer. And I don't think it's unreasonable to say that the team, that the, the RepRap team, 
sorry, the work that the RepRap team did, led by Vic and, and others on, on the team, is really kind of the cause of the modern 3D printing revolution as we've known it. The basic things they worked out in those early stages became instrumental in, uh, in what we now know as, as, as um, 3D printing. And in fact, uh, Vic demoed a, an, an early incantation an early incarnation of the RepRap at an LCA, and I think it was around 2005, 2006, I wasn't able to find the, the reference, but a, a very uh, significant contribution to the technical commons from a, from a New Zealander. And last but no means least, a Minister Claire Curran, a, a Minister in the New Zealand Government who's been instrumental in uh, open government and just generally driving openness across the pond in, in, uh, in New Zealand. So these are obviously only a snapshot. You know, we, we, could, we could do a day's worth of talking and still not cover more than a fraction of the, the, the tremendous contributions we've had from the, uh, in the Australian New Zealand um, community. But I think you get the, I get the idea. It's a great, and so I said that it's really a great community to be a part of. And I was, I was chatting with someone just now, just before I walked on stage, and if, if you've been involved for more than five years, it starts to become quite an important part of your life. I've had the good fortune at nearly age 50 to be doing this for, for 20 years, and it's a significant part of my own journey, and I think that's, a, that's something that's common across uh, for many of, us, many of us here. So we've talked about the community in a, as a free software a sense, but it's also, I think, a great community to, to work in. So with that, with that in mind, um, I'll talk a little bit about working in free software and, and open hardware. I'm going to consciously avoid talking too much about general job stuff. I mean, bits of it will be necessarily, but there's any number of excellent references out on the internet about sort of just the modern, modern workplace. So I've sought in these, in these uh, coming few slides and, and the remarks that accompany them to really just focus on things that are specific to, to free and open source software and, and open hardware. So to, to kick off, um, just thinking about getting ready to go get a job. So you're thinking, oh, actually, I'd like to go and work in that free software space or perhaps change to a, to a different, different job. Just a few thoughts on, on that sort of process of getting ready. Be visible in the projects of relevance. Whatever domain you're going to go and work in, spend the time to get involved in them. Um, have some consciousness or be, be aware of what people see when they type your name into a search engine because you can be sure they will do that. Um, if you're in your... Uh, CV or in your application you're saying, proclaiming to be the, the greatest kernel developer or the greatest Python contributor out there, your GitHub or other statistics should probably reflect that or you may wish to adjust what you say because people will go and go and research that. In that process of preparation, be yourself. So not, not suggesting anyone changes who they are, but just be conscious that you're going, in going to work for a, a business, there's going to be certain expectations they have and you need to be conscious that you fit, fit well with, within that. I raised LinkedIn not to make any particular value judgments, but certainly based off my own experience and that of some colleagues and, and friends recently, it, it really is a thing. Uh, if, you're, if you're seeking employment in any tech field at the moment, you really need to have some sort of up-to-date presence there and, and have it be a, a reasonable one. Put a bit of time and again, plenty of references out there on how to, how, to, how to do that. Finding a new job seems pretty daunting at the best of the times, but the, the best place to start is, is your people networks. Reach out to, to folk you know and uh, to see what, have conversations, see what's, see what's out there, your local user groups, Lynx user groups, uh, um, Python user groups, etc. cetera, uh, excellent places to, to make some of the connections you need in order to find that, that, um, that ideal job. Conferences are a great place to start. There was a job spot here at LCA uh, on Wednesday. The wiki is still up and there's a wealth of information in the, the jobs part of the wiki, which I commend to you, and I think from memory, there's a jobs board just out, just out the hall, which I noticed this morning actually has stuff on both sides now. So it's a double density job source, which I commend to, commend to all of you. The projects you work on are also uh, often overlooked, but an obvious place to start. You're presumably sitting here because you have or are aspiring to have some involvement in open source or free software projects. Talk to people in a project, see what's out there. You might, you might well be pleasantly surprised at what, what opportunities uh, present themselves. Um, the process of applying for a job and negotiating, this is, this is kind of the, can be the, the tricky bit at times. Obviously be very professional and courteous, that should go without saying, but even if you are going to work for the coolest, hippest company out there, just be conscious of what their organisational culture is and reflect that in the way you approach them, you apply for them. And for that matter, be, be sure that you're actually going to fit, but you need to be comfortable as, with them as, as much as they do with you. Seek out people who work there if you possibly can, talk to them, get the sort of inside goss on, okay, well such and such a company 
looks really, really nice on the outside, but what's it actually like inside? And unfortunately, our, our industry in particular is littered with examples where the outside facade doesn't necessarily match the, match the inside. So that's where, where I think talk, talking to people who work there already can be, be well worthwhile. I've been on both sides of the interview process, uh, the person doing the interviewing, but also the person being interviewed. Um, and if there's a consistent theme in that, you, you need to know your stuff. I mean, that hopefully would go without saying. But please don't ever feel you need to blackguard your way through it or, or, or make stuff up. In the majority of cases when you're in, a, in, a, in an interview situation, the people interviewing actually want you to succeed. The fact you're there in front of them or you're on the phone with them, Skype, whatever it might be, you've already got through one hurdle. At this, this point, they want you to get through, so they're not normally trying to trip you up. But if you start to make stuff up, then you get caught out and, uh, and, and trip yourself up in the process. They're really interested in how you're thinking, not whether you've got knowledge. You can always acquire the knowledge, but the, the thought processes that go underneath it are, are not necessarily so much. So give some, sort of sa yeah. give some thought to your salary expectations and stick to them. Money is always a bit of a dirty, dirty topic, but it's a, it is a, a reality. Um, I encourage you to seek out friends, trust people you trust who have similar sort of roles and ask them that awkward question, well, hey Sue, or hey Fred, what do you actually earn? Because I'm looking at getting a similar job to you because my observation for talking from casual conversations over the years is people have very, very wide ranging um, views on what salaries should be and they're often actually, uh, uh, people tend to price themselves under rather than over a lot, a lot of the time. And that initial process of negotiating and um, working through those salary. You really only get to do that once. Once you're in the job, it's pretty hard to, to make a significant change from there. But actually, particularly one page I would particularly commend to you is Valerie Aurora's page on salary negotiations. It's, a, it's only a couple of pages, but it's a really good resource on, with some ideas on how to, how to approach this. This last bullet point is shamelessly uh, stolen from a talk I heard yesterday. But um, particularly if you're going to work for free an open source software or an open hardware company, give some thought to asking to keep copyright on your code, Most, and there's, there's a few other pieces in that around non you know, so what, what other things you might be asked to sign about intellectual property, but uh, if you're going to work for a reasonable modern company, they'll, they'll probably have some openness, openness to that at least. Once you're in the job, so you've done, done all the negotiations, you've got your dream job. The other thing is um, someone who's been fortunate enough to both be an employee but also a manager is um, don't don't sweat getting into the groove. It will take time for you to get up to speed in a new job. And most of us are fairly sort of fairly driven. We're doing something we're passionate about. And I've seen time and time again that translates into some poor soul who's just started in a new job. They're three weeks in and they're getting all bent out of shape because I can't, I can't do this. And it's, well, actually, I wasn't expecting you to. I was kind of, you know, if you're at three weeks, you know where the bathroom is and how to get in and out of the building. We're on a, we're in a, we're in a, on, onto a good thing. So don't sweat that if you don't, if you're not immediately. Uh, functional. If you just started a three months contract, that's a slightly different kettle of fish, but, but here I'm, I'm talking about specifically so when you're in a, a full time role. I'm going to come back to this a little bit, but um, getting, out of, getting out of the house every now and then, many of us now end up working from home and that's a social contact, getting out of the house remains really, really important. So even though you've just started this cool job and you're really loving what you're doing, you're working with a great bunch of people, do still step outside occasionally and do some of those, those sort of healthy things. And that sort of flows into the whole concept of work life balance. One of the joys we have as free software developers, open hardware developers, is many of us get to or are working on things that we're really, really passionate about. That can translate into poor work habits, either in the micro or the macro, by, me, by which I mean in the micro sense, just working too long on a particular day, sitting there too long, or you neglect family and other commitments simply because, oh, I can just get this finished, kind of thing. No, really, it probably can, probably can wait. Know when to jump. Um, one of the downsides again, of that same passion that so many of us enjoy in, in the work we do is a tendency to stay too long. And unfortunately, there are poisonous workplaces out there, or just career-wise, maybe it's been too long. Don't be afraid to jump, because my, my observation is most of us will tend to stay longer in a role than perhaps would have been ideal. And it's very rare I've actually met someone who said, I jumped too, too soon, perhaps with the, occasion, with the occasional exception of someone who sort of left the company right before it IPO'd, but that's a different, uh, different kettle of fish. <laughs> A very brief aside to um, people managers, I've had the privilege to uh, both be, a, be an employee and, and have excellent managers myself, but also to have managed some wonderful, wonderful people over the years. One of the things I always strove to do as a people manager, and I would implore other people managers to do, is take what you're doing as a people manager as seriously in terms of the welfare and the human side of your role 
take that at least as seriously as you would writing secure, efficient code. Because ultimately your, the welfare of the people you're, you're, in your team is a large part of your responsibility. If you get it wrong, it kind of has some, um, obviously some fairly negative side effects. And I'd respectfully suggest that if that sort of notion of trying to take that aspect, the people aspect of people management seriously, if that sort of makes you feel uncomfortable or I don't want to do that, look at getting some training into it. And if it's not something you can feel you can do effectively, then I suggest it's, it's probably not for you. And you're probably actually going to do a better, better thing in the longer term of stepping out of that role and moving back into a technical, technical position. Because it isn't for, for everyone. That's not a, a value judgment. It's not because anyone's lesser. But it just doesn't, doesn't suit everyone. And keep that in mind. So I have a little bit of a, a quick digression. Um, excuse me. So I would implore all of you to give some thought to your uh, physical and mental well-being. Ours is a very, very sedentary hobby or profession in the main. We spend most of our time hunched over very ergonomically in front of the keyboard. Um, we sit down for too long. We, 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 sit, we uh, work at a standing desk for too long. We stare at our computer screens for too long without taking breaks. It's actually not that great for our body. So if you take nothing, away, nothing else away from my... Um, talk this morning, please give some thought to your, your, phys your physical and mental well-being. There's also a comment about vegetable, eating more vegetables later, maybe take, make that the, the real takeaway. But um, j jokes aside, that sort of the physical well our physical well-being is inexorably linked to our, our mental and cognitive being, so please take, take care of that. You've only got sort of the one body to, to work with. Depression and mental illness is a real thing for so many of us in, the, um, in our community. Get the help you need with that beyond blue. Uh, blue hackers are excellent resources, but a, a healthy physical regime can help with that as well. It's not by any means the only solution, clearly, but it's a, it can be an important part, part of that. Um, diet's important, hence the whole eating more vegetables reference. Um, beer isn't actually a vegetable. It comes from vegetables, but it's not <laughs> actually a vegetable, and preferably be eating vegetables that didn't come from, from a tin. They're small, small things, but they're small things you can do and make a big difference to, to, to both your, your personal life, but also your professional uh, journey it as well. On the exercise front, um, I think that's a recommendation these days of 30 minutes three times a week and that can just be a brisk walk around the block. The best thing I found ever is to actually do it with other people, with a, with a family member or a colleague because if you're be kind of beholden to someone else, you've got Fred or Sue waiting for you, you're much more likely to actually drag yourself out of bed or out of the office or whatever you need to go and do that. And I guarantee you'll feel, feel, feel better afterwards. And I'm, I'm, high, I'm heartened actually that uh, running boffs, for example, have become a thing at LCAs now for many, many years. That's not if we, sort of years ago, it was possibly drinking boffs, actually. Um, anyway, <laughs> so we, we've, we've, made some, we've made some useful, made some pro, useful progress there. Staying current. So there's, there's just a, a couple of things on skills. One of the things I, I've always tried and do myself, and I've encouraged my teammates and colleagues to do, is with uh, the permission of another party, look over your workmate or, or part, work colleague's shoulder. So this is, just, this is just a really, really simple tip, right? The only reason I learnt it, and I'm, not, I'm a bear of small brain at the best of times, was because I was watching someone smarter than me doing their day job. So just talk to a colleague, you're new to your team or someone else, and just get, with their permission, follow what they're doing and um, learn some really interesting hints and tips along the way. Do something that's not part of your regular job. If you're normally a big systems hyperscale developer doing OpenStack, tinker with embedded systems. If you're normally doing embedded systems, work the other way around. We're at a really, really exciting time in terms of the evolution of the underlying technology for so much of what we do. There's some really interesting parts in the middle of things you can do with an ESP32 or an ESP8266 or SDM32. So you've got these very cheap, very small microcontrollers with incredible computing power. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with this. Um, just tinker with that. Do something outside your normal, normal work domain just to broaden your skill base and to, to otherwise stay current. The, um, just watching Donna trying to take a photo of <laughs> Sorry. Um, so start today with security blogs and the like. Um, we've had some issues with security recently in the industry. Um, <laughs> kind of awkward. And, but jokes aside, um, do take time to read the blogs on this. I had the good fortune to work for a couple of years with, uh, in a company that specialised in cyber security. It was really, really interesting to get the perspectives of people who were at least as deeply engaged with, uh, with cyber security and network security and the like as my former colleagues had been with kernel engineering and on the one hand realising how doomed we were, 
but also on the other hand, just getting a sense of some of the deeper things you need to need to think about. Last but no means least, take the link, take the lid off, and tinker with hardware. And if you if you're a bit squeamish with soldering irons or screwdrivers, there's excellent um, videos online out of teardowns of all sorts of interesting kit. The reason I'm coming back to this is I think having a bit of an appreciation of what's under the hood is something we, we've tended to lose a little bit over the years and there's a bit of, hopefully a little bit of a show and tell going on as we, as, um, as I'm talking. Did that get me? Go. Did it get passed around? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so just, yeah, just a quick digression, there should be a, couple, a little bit of show and tell hopefully going through the audience, starting in the middle of going out and sort of just a couple of chips that um, passing passing around. Right, where are we? Make your hair while the sun shines. So very briefly, uh, this squirrel away for you, Bob, for a rainy day. While you're in the job, be prepared for the moment when you're not. Uh, keep your networks going. I talked about this a few slides ago in the process of finding a job. You've established networks of people and connections. Keep those networks going even when you're in a job and not even necessarily considering a change. And in that process, keep an eye out for whatever your next steps might be, because it might be a step you're going to make by choice, or it might be one that's forced upon you through, through, uh, through circumstances. Because some, you, might, you never know when you might find that you're actually no longer working in free and open source software and open hardware and need to find something else to do. So this, brought, this was really what came about with the whole you're fired now what? And I'm going to present two aspects of this. So the first one is really in the moment. You've unexpectedly found you're without a, without a job. First thing, don't panic. I mean, seriously, like it's not fun by any stretch of the imagination. I don't in any way say to, do, to diminish it. But don't just panicking, particularly going out in a Twitter storm, won't help anyone. It might make you feel better in the moment, but it will work against you in literally every other respect thereafter, because your new employer is going to look and go, oh, hmm, OK. So, um, it's not personal, and this is a little bit of a, excuse me, sorry, this is a little bit nuanced. The fact that a company's made you redundant or whatever has happened, it, it's not generally personal. It's not to say companies don't make poor decisions or companies don't do silly things. But the way to frame it, I think, is it's the position that's no longer needed, not you. A company's done some restructures, a particular line of business is no longer continuing, whatever it might be. It's the position, it's the work you were, that you were doing, that it was the job that has gone away, not you. It's not necessarily, you're, you're the poor bunny who happened to be doing that, but it's not actually you that's at fault in any, any reasonable way, shape or form. So it's not a personal, personal attack in that sense. Give some thought as to whether it's legal, and if you have, it's not my place to provide. Uh, that sort of advice clearly, but if you think it is an unfair dismissal, then um, seek advert further advice before you sign stuff and just be sort of con see if you actually need to be doing something a bit more proactively in that regard. So the aftermath, it's a week or two on, whatever it might be. It is normal to feel a bit rubbish. We do invest heavily in the work we do, particularly for stuff we're passionate about, and it's entirely normal if you feel a bit, hmm, it's a bit, bit iffy. Self-care, the stuff I was just talking about earlier, at this point has become more important than ever because you really need to sort of have those sorts of things there to, to, to um, just to be looking after yourself and not fall into, into despair. Be aware of the imposter syndrome, and if you're unfamiliar with the term, uh, quick Google, but it's basically you know, self-doubt or that sort of, oh, you know, I've been kidding people all along. I'm not actually up to all these wonderful things I've been doing. The thing I've been consistently surprised by is I've had, I've talked to, friends and colleagues in the free software community and outside, these astonishingly accomplished people, all of whom virtually have had some moments when they've lost a job or had some employment change unexpectedly where they've felt um, that that's sort of it's, it's something wrong with me. It clearly would be entirely inappropriate for me to name names, but these are people who you would least expect to have those sort of wobbles, but pretty much, pretty much everyone, everyone does. In the process of finding new work, then I suggest try and keep a couple of opportunities in the pipeline. Don't apply for something and then just wait to hear about it. Try and keep a few on the go because you never know which one's going to, going to shake out. In re-engaging re with your, your networks to find those sort of roles, talking to a friend at a, at a company you want to go and work for, don't assume that they'll remember you. It's not personal, they're, just, they're going to get busy, but then they're actually occupied with their day job process of helping you find the next one. It's just a small part. It's something they consider important, but it's quite okay to remind them. Now, you need to use your self-judgment or use your best judgment as to how often to, to do that. But um, do, keep those, do do those follow-ups every now and then. The other thing I'd suggest in the process of trying to find the next thing is um, kind of keeping the search a little narrow to begin with. So don't sort of, in the same way I'm suggesting not to blast things on Twitter as soon as you're unemployed. 
just kind of keep that, those initial inquiries a little bit low key because you, you never know, you might actually be able to make a transition quite smoothly without having to tell the world there's been something slightly more calamitous taking place. The um, final point there is to balance the, the whole taking something, anything is better than waiting for, for the dream job. And by that I mean most of us would like as we, as we move along in our career to go from to something better, whatever that might mean. But there's always going to be a point where actually you do just need a job in order to pay the rent and those sorts of things. So that's something that sort of ties in with your personal circumstances, obviously, but gives some thought as to is it really practical to wait for that dream job or should I just get out there and go out there and do three months of HTML programming or whatever, whatever it might be. So talking of dream jobs, another bit of a, bit of a digression. As I touched on earlier, I've, I'm fortunate enough to just recently, back in November, started my own dream job. And uh, that's what's prompted a bit of a, a little bit of a show and tell. So hopefully, somewhere in the audience, and I think it's possibly still in the fairly early stages as one, there's probably another, hopefully. Um, so there's a couple of Power 9 chips uh, floating around in the audience, and I'll slowly work their way back. That's a die micro photo of a modern Power 9 CPU. The particular part that's, parts that are floating around, they clock at about 4 gigahertz, they've got 24 cores in them. Uh, their internal memory bandwidth is like 7 terabytes a second, pretty nuts. Um, 120 gigabytes of external memory bandwidth, multiple PCIe Gen 4 lanes, open CAPI and VLink connects for talking to, um, uh, to either to FPGAs or GPUs in a, in a coherent memory address space. All sorts of really cool programming stuff, which we, I think often we don't often stop to think about. But there's some other numbers I thought it would be fun to, to talk about. So, it's a 14 nanometer process. 14 nanometers is quite narrow, to say the least. The parts that are going around have 8 billion transistors in them, 8 by 10 to the 9 individual transistors and other components in it. That chip has 25 kilometers of very, 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 very fine wires in it, connecting all those individual parts together. That's why it looks, you get that kind of rainbow effect, because you're literally dealing with something with the feature size is smaller than the wavelength of light. As a, a colleague from a, a member company pointed out earlier on in the week, those very, very same very, very fine wires ca are carrying up to 150, 200 amps, depending on what the chip's doing at any particular time. There's some pretty cool engineering in that, right? I was talking uh, through, through email with a, a colleague at that, uh, another, another member company, same member company, different part of it. The chips, um, I didn't pass this around just because it would be practical, but we, you know, the normal sort of chip, 3,900 pins on the back of it, a lot of pins. But in order to accomplish those 3,900 connections off to the rest of the system, there's 19,000 little wires going from different points on that chip to the bond out points on it. The reason I say this is we, we, we've gotten so used, I think, to stop to thinking up at the higher levels of, um, to, of, of system design that we forget the, the underlying tech that's... Um, uh, it is actually kind of cool. The other thing that's nice with Power 9 too, and this is true of all, uh, all, certainly all modern power microprocessors, is you don't get a free operating system with it that you didn't expect to have there. <laughs> yeah, so com coming towards the, the end of my presentation, just a, a couple of slides on, uh, on the Open Power Foundation. In, in, and this I'm also particularly keen to respect the, the norm at a LCA keynote is you don't get too commercial. And we're a, a foundation rather than a, a true commercial entity, but nonetheless didn't want to bang on too much about, about what we do. So the Open Power Foundation was founded in, in 2013 by um, five companies, Google, IBM, Mellanox, NVIDIA and Tyan. We're now at over 300 members. Uh, the, uh, our platinum members now are Google, IBM, Mellanox, Micronon, NVIDIA, Red Hat, Ubuntu and Xilinx. And yes, I am still committing them to memory. The, the function, the key function of the uh, Open Power Foundation is to promote collaboration around the power architecture and related technologies. So that's chips, as are hopefully still wandering around, systems, uh, software, both free and open source software and commercial and complete solutions. And the, the bulk of that um, collaboration is done through our various technical working groups, which any member is, is, is welcome to join and member, membership is, is free for, for individuals. That's done under the guidance of the various different working groups. The purpose of all this is to ultimately to develop the specifications that form mo all modern open power systems, whichever vendor they come from. And it's traditional, I guess, in many ways to think of power and think of, of IBM as being the originator of the chip. But these days, there's something of the order of 2025 20, different manufacturers other than IBM making power hardware. And also from a sort of a, an accessibility kind of standpoint, costs basically the same as any other server hardware these days. So there's no real premium there and a significant performance upside. 
The other thing we're seeking to do within the foundation is um, build the overall community and ecosystem and this is something I'd certainly encourage all of you to give some thought to because we've had a couple of conversations during the course of, uh, of this week talking about the, the openness of our software stack. And I've talked to a few people about it and I'm yet to sort of find a, 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 a counter case as it were. But we're pretty sure that modern open power systems from the various different vendors are unique in being the only ones that by default run an entirely open source software stack. So the bootloaders, the management code, the firmware, the fan controllers, everything in that system is open up on GitHub and, and freely available to hypervise the Linux kernel. And a bit of a shout out to Sir Tyson with the Australian Free Software Ecosystem as a lot of that work is led by the Auslabs team at IBM in, in Canberra working with the broader, the broader ecosystem. So we think, we have, I think, in uh, modern open power systems at least poss one possible solution to getting a freer, open, a freer so software stack for us all to be uh, operating on. We'd, and we'd absolutely welcome your, your participation. We're going to do a boff. We haven't put it in the wiki yet because it only occurred to me, frankly, this morning to, to put it in there. <laughs> and I thought tinkering around with the wiki right before I do a keynote might not be the right thing to be, to be doing. So we'll have a, an open power boff on Friday afternoon in, during the... During, um, the afternoon, time, afternoon tea time slot, so we'll uh, put more details on that to, to follow. And so to wrap up a little bit with a, with, a, with a few conclusions, we're part of a really, really vibrant free and open source and open hardware community both here and abroad. I've talked about it in the Australian New Zealand sort of context, but uh, because largely because that's where we happen to all be sitting at the moment, but we are very much part of a broader international community and the thing I've been heartened with every year both uh, when attending LCAs when I've had the good fortune to travel to conferences abroad and I talk to fellow free software community members overseas is how important this conference has become and the Australian free software uh, community has become to the, on, the, on the wider stage and it's been a, a bit of a theme I think through some of the other presentations during the course of the week. So we can, we can be proud of that. We've accomplished a lot and sort of my eye chart earlier on only painted a, a small proportion of that but I think we, we've really done some pretty pretty amazing stuff for a small couple of small countries. But I think the most exciting things lie before us, and I kind of chose these words, I guess, a little carefully, because unfortunately, in a way, I actually mean exciting in both kind of sense, exciting in, in a good, good way, because there's all sorts of cool stuff that's going to come along. But we do have some potentially exciting things happening that we haven't yet discovered that may be the not so good meaning of exciting, and that uh, they, they are also, I think, in our future. And with that in mind, we very much need all of you here and perhaps those of you watching later to be a part of this, this process at every, every layer of the stack and particularly I'd encourage you to start thinking about tinkering with the low level systems in all their different forms. Look back at the kernel, firmware, those sort of layers because we need good smart people working on that on chip design and so forth as well. I look forward to working with you and morning tea. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you very much. Another round of applause, please. Um, so. Uh